Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to CSIS. Um, thank you all for coming um, today. Uh, we're very, very fortunate uh, today to have with us a number of, of key experts and personalities um, who are coming together to talk about uh, global tobacco control efforts uh, with a view towards the uh, high-level meeting um, on uh, non-communicable diseases uh, that lies uh, ahead in September. Um, we uh, felt that uh, as part of a series of programs that we've put together here starting uh, late last year and extending into this year, uh, trying to bring forward different personalities to talk about um, uh, the, this very important meeting that it was uh, it was quite important uh, that we be able uh, to put a focus upon tobacco control. Uh, as you'll be hearing from Dr. Tom Frieden in his major uh, keynote address here uh, uh, from CDC, uh, th this, is an inst this is an instance in which there's been major diplomatic progress with the formation of the FCTC, several years of very concentrated effort and work and putting programs in place and gathering data and attempting to get compliance uh, uh, and, and raise the political will and that this is a big moment as we look forward uh, at uh, moving, uh, moving uh, uh, events um, uh, and seizing, seizing this, this opportunity. Um, we're going to break our program into, into two parts. Uh, Dr. Frieden uh, will open up uh, with the, an address. We'll have a brief conversation after that, and we'll open to you for comments and questions. Uh, he'll have to depart no later than 5.30, and then we'll move into the second part of our program where we'll be having a, a roundtable discussion with a number of prominent individuals who've come to us today, uh, who I'll introduce as we get seated, um, who are uh, from their own individual institutional settings are key players in implementing and moving forward uh, the vision for how to achieve much lower prevalence and much greater control uh, over the uh, use of tobacco worldwide. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Frieden today at CSIS. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much for being here. Uh, as some of you know, I spent over a decade working on tuberculosis control, and then I've spent much of the past a decade working on tobacco control, and I've been thinking recently about how those two things differ. So uh, fighting communicable diseases is quite difficult, uh, but I find that fighting non-communicable diseases is even harder because microbes such as mycobacterium tuberculosis don't, for example, lobby politicians to allow it to continue to spread. <laughs> Nor, in fact, do they fund scientists to say that really TB is not so bad nor do they rebrand themselves as uh, light or low tar uh, TB that would be less harmful or pay for ads with beautiful people to say that uh, their lives were enhanced by having TB. So there are real problems in non-communicable disease control and we need to have our eyes open about them or we will not have success. Uh, the CDC has a core role in control of non-communicable disease in several ways. First, surveillance and epidemiology, and you'll be hearing later uh, this afternoon from Samira Asma, who has worked with WHO on the Global Tuberculosis Surveillance System, which really is the first non-communicable disease surveillance system that is worldwide, uh, and I think a model not just for TB, but for other conditions as well. Superb work, well standardized and valid, so that you can get comparisons between countries that are valid and comparisons within one country over time that are valid. Identifying risk factors and prevention strategies, linking data to public health action, and helping to build national capacity for action. In 1970, there were more, slightly more deaths among children than among young and middle-aged adults. Over time, child deaths decreased and adult deaths increased. And that trend has continued uh, steadily, so that now there are more than three times as many deaths among adults as there are among children. 
Deaths among adults, in fact, continue to increase, even as death rates for both adults and children have fallen substantially. As you all know, the global burden of tobacco is enormous. 100 million people killed in the 20th century. In the 21st century, unless urgent action is taken, it will kill 1 billion people. Uh, there will be 8 million deaths per year by 2030. It is the leading preventable cause of death, killing up to half of people who use it. And the world's leading cause of death is now a man-made product. Tobacco kills 15,000 people every day, one person every six seconds, 600,000 people killed by secondhand smoke. Half of tobacco-related deaths occur during the most productive years of life. Uh, one might quibble with whether those are the most productive years of life, but uh, during productive years of life. Uh, tobacco, including both healthcare costs and lost productivity, costs nearly 1% of the total world output of GDP. And tobacco kills more people worldwide than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. And in fact, if you look at the other leading causes of death, um, acute respiratory infections and tuberculosis, a substantial proportion of those deaths are in fact from uh, tobacco. Nearly two-thirds of the world's smokers live in 15 low- and middle-income countries, 40% living in China and India, 62% in the top 10 countries, which you can see there, which are mostly low- and middle-income, and then 75% in the top 20 countries, of which 13 are low- and middle-income. So there is an ability to focus and make a big difference, but there's also an ability for any country to make substantial improvements, and we'll see that in a minute. Tobacco will kill an increasing number of people in developing countries, even as deaths decline slightly in high-income countries. And co tobacco control interventions are proven to work, yet few countries use them. Effective tobacco control is within reach. The FCTC has been signed by nearly all countries in the world and ratified by nearly all as well, the U.S. a notable exception. Uh, WHO's Empower Package uh, of evidence-based tobacco control measures assists in country-level implementation of effective measures. And the Empower strategy puts together what works in tobacco control. Monitoring tobacco use and prevention policies, and I really compliment the authors of the report that's on your uh, chairs of the Americas, very clear information about what is the status of tobacco control. This is very important to have. It's a core means of promoting accountability of governments and civil society for progress and of encouraging healthy, healthy competition among countries. Protecting people from tobacco smoke, secondhand smoke kills. Just think if uh, we were allowing people to spew asbestos in workplaces. Right? We, we would think that was terrible. And yet secondhand smoke is killing people at a much higher rate and we allow it to continue to occur despite uh, the signatures on the FCTC and the fact that it is well documented that going smoke-free saves lives, doesn't hurt business, and doesn't cost money to implement. Offering help for people to quit tobacco use, warning people about the dangers of tobacco, and you have, again in that booklet, some nice examples of PAC warnings. Uh, the U.S. is now implementing PAC warnings. Uh, I anticipate that the some aspects of the tobacco industry may sue to try to stop that, but it's law of the land, and I anticipate that U.S. will have hard-hitting PAC warnings up uh, by the legislative deadline. And so join the countries that are doing that. But warning isn't just about PAC warnings, it's also about hard-hitting ads. And in fact, this is the only area in tobacco control with the slight possible exception of reduce, reducing tax evasion, which requires some government financial investment. Um, it's important to keep tobacco in the world's view, in the view of individuals. If the tobacco industry weren't spending tens of billions of dollars on marketing and promotion and weren't putting so much nicotine in each cigarette or ensuring that it's there, that they keep people hooked, then maybe it wouldn't be so important to spend this much money on anti-tobacco advertising. But even in these fiscal times, it's crucial that we continue the commitment. Enforcing bans on tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship, and raising taxes on tobacco, which is the single most effective way to reduce tobacco use, should be done in a way that increases 
the price of the lowest cost tobacco products, which means using specific taxes whenever possible as opposed to ad valorem taxes, because the specific taxes will result in a more expensive cigarette. Uh, otherwise, what you get is brand shifting uh, down to cheaper cigarettes if you just have a percentage tax. Uh, but raising taxes also means enforcing uh, and preventing tax evasion. In New York City, uh, the Empower interventions resulted after 10 years of no decline in tax, uh, uh, no decline in tobacco use in a substantial decline once taxes were raised, a further decline once people were protected against tobacco smoke. Uh, we had regular surveillance and saw that there was a stall after that. So we looked, what else could we do? We ran hard-hitting ads and warning of the dangers of smoking, and that led to a resumption in the decline such that there were 350,000 fewer adult smokers in a, the course of six years, 100,000 deaths prevented, uh, this was a, a decline of 25% in adult smoking and of 52% in teen smoking. Um, why did teen smoking go down more? Well, besides the fact that kids are smarter than adults, um, it's because they weren't addicted. So it's a lot easier not to start than it is to quit once you're addicted. Now, that was 25% over six years. When WHO looked at countries around the world, Uruguay came out as having the best tobacco control policies of any country in the world. A coordinated package of interventions. The first country in the Americas to go 100% smoke-free, high taxes, a comprehensive ad ban, large pictorial warning labels, 80% of the front and back, banning deceptive terms like light and low tar, and cessation services. Euromonitor, which is generally used by the tobacco industry to monitor uh, the uh, uh, commercial patterns, noted that there's little scope left to further increase restrictions on tobacco in Uruguay. But give us time, we'll think of ways. But what, what the results of that were, uh, one in four smokers quit. That's a 25% reduction in two years. So in New York City, we thought we were pretty good. We did 25% reduction in six years. This was three times as fast, 25% reduction in two years. I think this is the fastest reduction in smoking ever documented uh, in a, a, a large population anywhere. And it shows what's possible. So as we think about targets for the world, um, we're, we may be thinking of another 10 or 15 or even longer year time frame. We need to think about what is the best case scenario with c political commitment. Because what made this happen was the president of Uruguay, an oncologist who decided that he was going to do something about tobacco control and left office, uh, term limited out, with an approval rating higher than any president of Uruguay had ever had leaving office. So uh, political leadership is necessary and um, will be rewarded, but it requires dealing with the industry that I outlined uh, in my first few slides. Now there has been progress implementing Empower. In 2007, what you see on the y-axis is the proportion of the world covered by the different interventions. And um, anywhere from 200 million to 600 million people were fully covered by these effective interventions. By 2008, there was further progress, expanding health warnings and smoke-free environments. And when uh, WHO looked at the subnational level in large countries, they were able to identify quite a few more people who were protected. So significant progress, but far, far, far too little progress. Few people are adequately protected. No single policy intervention uh, has been comprehensively covered to cover, implemented to cover even one in 10 people in the world. And in low-income countries, it's even worse, uh, even lower levels of protection. There is a misconception that uh, tobacco use is a, and obesity for that matter, are diseases of affluence. In fact, uh, the reverse is true. What you will see in virtually every country in the world is that um, usually, perhaps after an, an initial period, but as of today, that rates of tobacco use, rates of obesity, rates of alcohol, harmful alcohol use are much higher in low, lower socioeconomic status groups than they are in higher socioeconomic status groups. And uh, this is a major challenge. The Global Adult Tobacco Survey um, is really a standard. It was completed in 14 high-burden countries and is underway in six more. 
The results are representative of 3.6 billion people, more than half of the world's population. More than 300,000 people were surveyed in their home in a randomized cluster sample fashion. Core survey questions have been established and are being incorporated now into a wide range of surveys that countries can do and international agencies can do so that we can all finally have a common case definition of what is a smoker, what is an ex-smoker, uh, what is exposure to secondhand smoke. And because we have those monitoring tools, we can uh, make much more progress. Those 14 countries, which account for about two-thirds of the world's smokers, show about 23% smoking rate, about 30% tobacco use rate, um, about 50% exposed to secondhand smoke either at home or both at home and in the workplace. Tobacco use varies enormously by country, including both um, smoked and smokeless tobacco of all types. You see uh, usage rates that go from uh, over 40% to 16% in Mexico, uh, and very different rates of ex-smokers. So you can see, for example, in looking at the data in Uruguay, you can see a, a rapid decline. Many people who quit smoking in the last one year or five years, uh, whereas in other places you see very few people who've quit. Russia and China have very few former smokers there. Uh, in some countries, many people smoke other types of tobacco, uh, and so uh, these alternatives are generally less expensive than cigarettes. This is smoking rates, um, including BDs, um, hand-rolled cigarettes, water pipes, uh, for countries where these are common. Um, and this represents a significant challenge for taxation because the sector may be informal and harder uh, to regulate. Some countries provide far more protection against secondhand smoke than others. Uh, and health warning labels on cigarette packs are much better at motivating cessation in some countries than in others. Now, empower policy intervention status is uh, not very good. And if you look at these countries, 15 high burden countries, you can kind of pick out the green. So there, there are some countries that have gone fully smoke free. In fact, there's at least one other than enforcing bans. There's at least one green in each category, but not many more. Uh, and uh, some partial and a lot of red here. So quite a bit of uh, uh, room for improvement. Implementing tax policies can save lives, increase government revenues. Uh, one estimate suggests that uh, just in nine countries, increasing tobacco taxation would generate $40 billion a year in revenues and save 28 million lives uh, by helping more than 100 million smokers to quit. There has been real progress in global tobacco control. A $500 million commitment from the Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Gates Foundation. Between 2007 and 2008, 19 countries strengthened tobacco control policies. Nearly 400 million people uh, were covered newly by at least one Empower policy at the highest level of implementation, increasing from 1.2 to 1.6 billion, so about a third increase. Uh, and some countries, such as Uruguay, have had very rapid progress. The Bloomberg Initiative has strengthened a global movement that precedes it uh, and has been joined by the Gates Foundation. Um, but hundreds of organizations are now working on tobacco control in dozens of countries. And civil society is getting stronger and stronger. And this is crucially important. Governments are also getting stronger. And this is crucially important. The third WHO Empower report will come out in the summer, focusing on health warnings. But despite progress, more and faster progress is needed. The level of awareness of the harms of tobacco and the range of those harms is quite low, particularly in certain parts of the world and in some populations. Implementation is scaling up far too rapidly. The tobacco industry continues aggressive opposition. There is, in many countries, a lack of political will for tobacco control. There is as yet no quantifiable international target for tobacco control. And government and private funding for tobacco control remains far too limited. In fact, if you look at even the low levels of taxation that we have now versus the dollars spent on tobacco control globally, tax revenues outpace spending on tobacco control by about 200 to 1. 
and even in low and middle income countries where tax revenues are minuscule, tobacco control is microscopic and tax revenues outpace um, uh, tobacco control spending by about 5,000 to 1. In fact, global tobacco control is drastically underfunded compared to other leading causes of death. And the message of this slide is not that we need to underfund other things as well, but we need to invest in tobacco control as a best buy in health. We estimated that 150 million lives could be saved in the 21st century by achieving a modest target of less than 20 by 2020. Uh, less than 20% smoking in any country by the year 2020. Uh, this would result in uh, current smokers quitting and future smokers not taking it up. The high level summit, as you all know, provides a unique opportunity. Uh, the first in 10 years, the goal is to prioritize prevention and control, to focus on developmental and other challenges and social and economic impacts, to secure support of government and heads of states for things that they can meaningfully commit to and then be held accountable for. I will say that there is a, a, a concern, and I've put it a little controversially, uh, about avoiding a clinical trap. Uh, now, clinical care is very important. And for things like blood pressure control uh, can make an enormous difference and should be done. But clinical measures are never going to have the population impact that measures can have uh, that are policy and affect all people. So take the example of tobacco control. <coughs> clinical cessation services are very important. And every doctor should be an advocate for tobacco control. Every smoker should be advised to quit. Every smoker who wants to quit should be prescribed medications which will double or triple their chance of succeeding. That is all true. But even if you do that very, very well, you will not have anything like the kind of impact that you'll have by smoke-free environments, hard-hitting anti-tobacco ads, tobacco taxation, or banning advertising, marketing, and promotion. The role of global tobacco control is very important for NCD control. If we can't do con tobacco control, we're not going to be able to have success in anything in NCD control. It's the most preventable of all of the NCD risk factors. There are already considerable policy gains and commitments, and the approaches that are used can easily be applied to control of other non-communicable diseases and their risk factors, building on the investments already made. Margaret Chan has said that reversing this entirely preventable epidemic must now rank as a top priority for public health and for political leaders in every country of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, let me open by turning back to the whole question of US policy priority and, and the upcoming summit, you know, the high level meeting in September. Um, where do the deliberations internally stand now as to how we want to use our leadership position moving into that? And what, what, what are the feasible goals and outcomes that would mark this as a successful gathering where U.S. leadership can leave uh, a strong imprint, in your view? Well, I think it's a challenge. I think we have uh, uh, a few challenges. On the one hand, there will be pressure from many sources not to be too controversial. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there will be challenges from many sources to include as much as possible. And the challenge in any UN undertaking is <coughs> the risk that you have high sounding and wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, well written flowery language, but nothing that's actually actionable, measurable, and accountable. And what we hope to achieve is to identify a limited set, uh, what I hope to achieve. I, I'm not speaking for the US government as a whole right now. Uh, but what I hope will be achieved through this whole process is a limited set of a actionable, accountable measures which will enable us to galvanize progress mm -hmm. uh, in tobacco control and other leading causes of non-communicable diseases. Can you tell us a little bit more what, what might those look like in terms of, I mean, I realize there's still deliberations around this and the Moscow Ministerial lies ahead and there's plenty of other 
moments, but what would that, what would success look like in terms of the, a very targeted effort with, by the U.S. to shape that? One issue would be specific measurable outcomes mm -hmm. that um, leaders could commit to. In tobacco control, those might include, for example, prevalence numbers. Mm -hmm. They might also include policy commitments right. with specific time frames. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, other non-communicable diseases, uh, there's a lot of focus on the some of the nutritional battles mm -hmm. that we know can be won. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of discussions now at the global level on, for example, sodium reduction and what can be done in terms of sodium reduction. These are things that are well done with coordination, so lend themselves to uh, global <laughs> efforts and also have the benefit of not costing a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at also in the dietary arena, the issue of artificial trans fat and whether that can be phased out over time. Now one of the comments that people often make who work in this area is that there's been a, a, a consistent barrier in leveraging high-level high political commitments and, and that getting ministries of finance, getting heads of state, Getting folks that are really powerfully placed to step forward has been one of the key factors. You mentioned this to, in, in some of your remarks. This meeting that's coming up is, would look like a pretty choice opportunity to try to, from within our own government and other governments, change that picture a bit. Can you comment a little on that and what might be possible? As you know, the U.S. has signed, has a, a law that allows us to do a lot more than we could do two years ago in tobacco mm -hmm. control. So that puts the U.S. government in a position of being able to say, yes, we're implementing mm -hmm. health warnings. Yes, we're uh, requiring disclosure of product contents. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we're looking at ways to further restrict um, marketing and promotion uh, in the U.S. <coughs> we hope to see leaders emerge who are willing to do what Tabaré Vázquez did in Uruguay mm -hmm. and say, we're going to be an example. And we hope to see really a, a, a constructive, healthy competition between countries to see who can achieve the biggest progress. I recall many years ago hearing of uh, two health ministers in uh, Central America. One asked, um, at a news conference, what's your infant mortality rate? And he leaned over to his chief of staff and said, uh, what's, he named the other country, 51. Then, then ours is 49. <laughs> um, now, based on real data from GATS and other sources, we hope that countries will begin competing for having smoke-free environments. And we're seeing some interesting things already where uh, tourism mm -hmm. is at potential risk. As more environments become smoke-free, people who are used to smoke-free environments become far less tolerant of, of being smoked on and exposed to carcinogens. So there are countries that are recognizing that they had better accommodate the growing smoke-free world if they want to maintain their status as desirable destinations. Mm -hmm. um, it also expresses a sense of being healthy and forward-looking. The challenge we have, again, is uh, the challenge of the tobacco industry really obscuring the tremendous benefits to governments and society of going smoke-free. I was just reviewing for, for some countries, um, at least a quarter of pregnant women smoke. And the burden of that on the next generation is enormous in low birth weight, in mm -hmm. complications of pregnancy, in neonatal intensive care unit stays, and the number of pregnant women exposed to secondhand smoke is also a tremendous burden on the next generation. So there's a lot that we have to do to encourage political leadership, and one of the best outcomes from uh, the September summit could be the emergence of countries who are willing to say, we, we are going to make a difference, and we're mm -hmm. going to hold ourselves accountable. You saw Putin. Uh, mm -hmm. commit recently mm -hmm. to substantial improvements in tobacco control in Russia. 
what will actually happen, we'll see. Mm -hmm. But at least now there is a clear commitment of a powerful government to do something about it. And I think what oh, you're seeing in an increasing number of countries a recognition of the importance. You're also, through the work of GATS and other surveillance systems, you're beginning to see some countries that thought they were doing better than they're doing recognize mm -hmm. that they too have had a stall in their progress and they had better refresh their strategies and reinvigorate their work if they're going to resume a downward trend. Now we've seen a lot of progress in Latin America and we'll hear a bit about that from uh, Adriana Blanco and others on our next panel. Um, if you were to, I mean, you, and you mentioned Putin, I mean, where else would you see the possibility of a, of a shift of a, you know, if you were to look out and say, okay, under an optimistic scenario, in the next couple of years, we could really see some big pivotal change occurring on account of a political change, a con change of consciousness, a change of leadership position. Where would you, where would you point us? You know, there have been uh, glimmers or even more than glimmers of progress virtually all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, some very positive policy changes in Egypt, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, even in China, which is really uh, the, the big challenge for mm -hmm. tobacco control. But even mm -hmm. in China, you're beginning to see a change in the social acceptability of tobacco. Uh, a beginning to recognize that giving cigarettes may not be the best thing to do in a socially uh, desirable, harmonious society way. Uh, so I think you have the potential to see significant progress in, in many parts of the world, and it's going to take really political leadership. I think this is the key lesson in tobacco control. Look at Uruguay. Look at Mexico City. Mexico City decided to go smoke-free, and uh, it was really a local decision for a variety of uh, health and other reasons. And in the course of just a few months, they made the city completely and very effectively smoke-free. Huge population, more than 10 million. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience that New York City would not have made the kind of progress it made mm -hmm. had it not been for the support of Mayor Bloomberg. So this kind of political commitment uh, and willingness to go to the mat and recognize that there may be controversy for a year or two, but after that, no one would ever go back. No one would ever go back to a world of a smoky restaurant or a smoky workplace once they've had a few months or a year mm -hmm. or two of living in that smoke-free purer, cleaner, healthier, more wholesome environment. Can you just talk about the economic interests and the power of industry? It's not just the tobacco industry. I mean, when you were in New York, you faced a hailstorm of opposition from, from restaurants and bars, and, and, and you had to change public expectations in order to sort of punch through that and, and get to the other side. There's a lot of, of, of of claims that the industry in, in many of the emerging markets and, and low-income countries that the tobacco industry wields enormous power. Can you just comment a little bit on that on sort of what are the limits or the crevices in that, in that power and what would the strategy look like for, for tackling that? Because clearly many leaders are not det deterred from thinking anew about, well, my city or my country really does need to begin to recognize this. And they have to calculate that against rising costs and, and a different change of consciousness among their own voting publics. Well, first, on the issue of smoke-free environments, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite clear that uh, going smoke-free doesn't hurt business. That's been shown repeatedly. It's also clear that business has an interest in it being a level playing field. So if you do allow many exceptions, that creates uh, economic mm -hmm. Um, inefficiency mm -hmm. that is harmful both to individual businesses and to business as a whole. So going smoke-free comprehensively is really quite important. The tobacco industry is a formidable enemy, to be very blunt about it. Uh, they, in some African countries, for example, have begun, even where it doesn't make a lot of sense from an agricultural standpoint, they've begun doing tobacco, for far <coughs> tobacco farming uh, by paying kind of above market prices to very prominent individuals, farmers, who now become uh, the lobbyists for the tobacco industry. Um, they, 
in many countries have raised the employment issue. So interestingly in China with simply mechanization and rationalization of the tobacco monopoly, there have been over 100,000 jobs that have been in excess. Now that is despite the uh, consumption of cigarettes unfortunately continuing to increase in China. But they waive tobacco control as a threat to social stability and employment mm -hmm. uh, in many countries. And these are real challenges. Um, I think um, emphasizing the issue of costs and being able to express costs more clearly is very important. In the US, it costs about $2,000 more per person per year to take care of a smoker than a non-smoker. Uh, now, if you say that, well, yes, but they're going to die sooner, so they'll do us all the favor of doing that, and they won't have pension costs or health care costs for that longer period of life, uh, that's a very crazy argument if you think about it. So we have to start with the agreement that we're, we're all not better off dead. Um, <laughs> and we want people to live longer and healthier lives. And good evidence from around the world suggests that not only do people who smoke die about 10 years younger, but they feel about 10 years older for those shorter li years that they live. Being clear about what the metric is, per person, per year, health care costs, and driving those down. Because in every country in the world, and certainly in this country, we need to be very cognizant of the need to reduce costs in health care. One sensitive issue is around U.S. trade policy and whether we should be uh, making exceptions with respect to tobacco in the way that we go about our trade policy. Do you have any thoughts on that? My understanding is that there's been a lot of progress in the way the U.S. has dealt with this issue, and I'd like to see what the remaining concerns are and, and see how the U.S. government could try to address those concerns, because I think it's a commitment to do so. Okay. Let's open the floor here for uh, questions. There's two microphones in the, in the front. Please introduce yourself and, uh, and uh, give us a quick comment or question. Uh, Tom Gallagher from SAIC, Oops. and Dr. Frieden, I'd like to ask a, a follow-up to one of the last questions. I lived in uh, Paraguay for a little over a decade uh, and was in a private practice. So many of my young patients smoked, and as I saw smoking decline in Uruguay and decline very, very uh, dramatically in uh, Brazil, where you could smoke anywhere, not 10 years ago, now you can't, Paraguay is different because one general owns the uh, concession for, to bring, to bring uh, tobacco in. Cigarettes today cost a package in Paraguay, I don't know, 30, 35 cents a package. And they have a, a fairly stable economy. How do you stop cigarette from being sold when there's so much money in it uh, for the government? Is there any power that can, that can intervene somehow in a country like Paraguay? And just to follow that up, in my travels in India, so many incredibly poor people chew tobacco. And, and I don't remember the cost of chewing tobacco, but it was so incredibly cheap, I couldn't even imagine they could get it to market for that price. So is there any way to intervene in those kinds of things? Thank you. One of the things that tobacco control has going forward is that governments everywhere need money. Uh, revenue hunger is widespread in governments. And tobacco taxation is a triple win. It is uh, something that generates significant amounts of revenue. It is something that saves lives. And it is either the most popular or the least unpopular form of taxation there is. So tobacco control has that going for it. Um, there is a unique problem of things like Gutka and Bidis in India. And a, a, a very thoughtful report suggests that the current government policies actually are, 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 are in India are uh, kind of warping the market and are preventing the consolidation of manufacturers because of uh, some tax uh, policies that encourage small non-mechanized producers. Um, <coughs> and if those policies were to change, you would have a consolidation of the industry which would then uh, enable uh, you to tax and regulate more effectively. There's a lot of efforts in India dealing with um, Gutka and Bidis, and uh, the, the, the panel can, can discuss those 
with much more detail and knowledge than I can. But um, it's a problem. But ultimately, it's a political problem. Ultimately, it's whether government will allow the tobacco industry to allow people to keep dying in order for them to keep selling their product. Uh, whether the political powers will say, we're not going to let any worker be exposed to cancer-causing chemicals on the job. And those things can be done. So I, I'd, I'd be interested in what the panel has to say about your question, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Do you have other questions? Please. Hello, my name is Marika, and I have the pleasure of being Adriana's colleague at the Pan American Health Organization. And uh, thank you for your presentation, and especially your interest in Latin America and Uruguay. But I notice in your statistics here that while there has been a decrease in smoking among men, or young men specifically in Uruguay, that young girls are smoking more, and that seems to be a trend in our region. I also noticed that in your presentation, besides showing the beautiful woman who was indeed targeted, that you don't really address this issue. And even the uh, convention doesn't really address this issue. And there seems to be a difference that certainly the tobacco companies are exploiting. And I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Thank you. Dealing with uh, men and women sec separately is very important. And the trends are, are just wildly different in different countries. China continues to have a rate of female smoking that's under 5%. Russia has a rate of female smoking that's almost as high as their very high rate of male smoking. So uh, different countries have different patterns. And it's very important to address those separately. And you're absolutely right that the GYTS strongly suggests that uh, increasing smoking among girls and women is a major issue that has to be addressed. Going smoke-free uh, will help with that. Raising taxes will help with that. Running specific hard-hitting ads that address uh, women and counter the actions of the tobacco industry is very important. Looking at the slim and ultra-slim and mild and low-tar and uh, highlighting those for the hypocrisy that they are, I think, are important methods. But this is definitely an area where we need to both better understand how to counteract it and take action and see what works. In the US, we're seeing something slightly different. We're seeing a continuing steady decline among female smoking. But the, the men, who of course are not as smart as women, are, are, uh, are not uh, decreasing their prevalence as much. Um, so. I think it is important to look at what works for different subpopulations. The same is true for, for example, uh, some of the racial and ethnic minority populations, tribal populations. Uh, um, American Indians in this country have an extraordinarily high rate of smoking. And um, interestingly, educational status has a kind of uh, interesting pattern in many countries where the lowest strata does not smoke the most, perhaps because they don't have the economic power. But when you get into kind of lower middle or upper lower uh, uh, socioeconomic status, you have the highest rates of smoking. And that is something that requires a very targeted, focused effort. Other questions? Yes, sir. And Good afternoon, Dr. Friedman, Monty Green from SAIC. My question is uh, related to, I guess I'll call them again, additional social trends. Uh, one of the observation as a parent uh, and someone who works in the community with many of our youth, um, there seems to be a trend um, that with the diversity of cultures um, that, is, that is changing, um, Whereas our ads tend to focus on cigarettes and smoking, it doesn't necessarily focus on tobacco. And the trend that I think we're seeing, especially among our youth, is moving toward things that are more acceptable in tobacco use, which certainly still causes the same problem. As an example, hookah is becoming very popular, uh, where you now even see in your nightclubs, your dance halls, places where youth as a pop culture get together, that it is freely acceptable to have hookah pipes throughout the dance facilities, those sorts of things. They have hookah restaurants. 
et cetera, et cetera. My question is, as these trends continue to make this issue more complex, uh, how do you see uh, the role of the CDC or other organizations addressing uh, these other trends uh, that are more focused on other tobacco and cultural issues? Thank you. Uh, on the one hand, we need to understand them better. On the other hand, we need to intervene more effectively. So uh, other smoked forms of tobacco, hookah, beedies, um, one of the things that we've learned is people are very good at rationalizing. So uh, California ran a very good campaign a few years ago. If you're a social smoker, you're a smoker. You know, any, any tobacco smoker is a smoker. And uh, the harms are quite substantial for any smoked product. And the harms are quite substantial for chewed products. One of the things that CDC does very uniquely is our tobacco laboratory in our National Center for Environmental Health. Our tobacco laboratory um, has smoking machines, perhaps the only smoking machines outside of the tobacco industry. And they have been able to document a series of uh, really I think shocking findings. For example, um, the, increase <coughs> the increase in free nicotine available in um, chew tobacco has been manipulated enormously so that a few years ago there was a huge increase in the amount of free nicotine available from chew tobacco. Now, free nicotine is essentially crack nicotine. It's very rapidly absorbed. It's very, very highly addictive. And it's what the industry learned to increase by um, changing the pH of cigarettes and increasing the addictiveness of cigarettes. And we need to understand those, those trends, and then we need to counteract them, both with education and where appropriate and feasible with regulation. Vinayak Prasad from WHO Geneva. Dr. Freedon, um, a very interesting uh, presentation you gave. You mentioned the uh, one-fourth of the women have a direct secondhand smoke exposure. But one thing which you didn't mention, which I find a little intriguing, is that you did not mention the linkage between tobacco and tuberculosis, given your two decades of experience. Now, what is it that prevents the tuberculosis control program from accepting that tobacco is a risk for TB and it leads to uh, premature TB deaths. And there's a whole body of uh, documentation which has been done in the last seven to eight years, but we do not see that kind of uh, an interface between these programs. Now, if we need to scale up tobacco control, how do we get the TB programs and the maternal child health programs to accept that it is a risk? What are the challenges? Even the USGHI, does not have any mention, and it treats tobacco as a cause, causative factor for NCDs, but nothing to do with uh, the communicable diseases. I, I think there is a, a consensus on the importance of addressing tobacco in the tuberculosis control world. It's important to be specific about what we want the tuberculosis control world to do. First off, uh, to improve tuberculosis control, it would be great to get people to quit smoking, but the tuberculosis control program only deals with TB patients. So you would want, at a minimum, every tuberculosis care facility anywhere in the world to be a smoke-free facility. Of course, every healthcare facility should be smoke-free, every worksite should be smoke-free, but at a minimum, you'd want for the tobacco control staff to ensure that their facility is smoke-free, and you'd want the tobacco control professionals to be advocates for tobacco control. It's been said that a doctor who smokes is worth $100,000 to the tobacco industry, and you would also want to ensure that all of the doctors working in that area are smoke-free. But we also have to be realistic about what can be achieved. So the rate of smoking is 20 25% in population, the rate of tuberculosis is measured in per 100,000. So even if you got every TB patient who smoked to quit, you would not significantly change the smoking rate in society. So for uh, tuberculosis, for tobacco control generally, the, what we really want from 
all healthcare professionals is that they be advocates for uh, tobacco control. My name is Jonathan Ewing. I'm a student at GW. Um, with the finite amount of political capital in the tobacco control movement, because it's not a politically uh, uh, prevalent issue, at least right now in the U.S., is it a prudent use of the, of the movement's political capital to push for FCTC ratification? Mm -hmm. And what would be uh, a, you know, the potential benefits of, of uh, achieving that goal? Well, if the U.S. ratified FCTC, we would have more say in the conference of parties and in the um, considerations in, uh, as part of the FCTC. It really comes down to whether the Senate would ratify. That, that's the bottom line uh, question. And I can't give you a political read on that. Um, I can tell you that it's probably less likely than it was a year ago. Um, but I can't tell you whether it's possible. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. Um, really enjoyed your presentation, which I thought was very straightforward and also very gave some powerful recommendations moving forward. Um, my name is Mark Hayes, and I uh, work with Corporate Accountability International. We've been involved um, on global tobacco tr control work for a while now. And um, I thought it was uh, really good how you were able to identify the f one key criteria, which is real, true leadership from um, politicians who have the power to move this forward and a need to acknowledge the um, the vested interests of the tobacco industry and some of the, the, the power they're putting forth. And one key element of the FCTC that we have worked uh, on closely has been Article 5.3, which deals with safeguards to prevent or restrict tobacco industry interference in implementation of the FCTC and other uh, tobacco control policies. And um, I think my question for you is, um, you know, I would make the case that um, the 5.3 is one of the tools in the toolkit that different parties to the treaty have among the other tools you've laid out to push for more successful and thorough implementation. So with that in mind, um, at this high level meeting, where do you see that tool or discussion, that tool fitting in in that conversation? And um, what can the US do to move it forward given as our last speaker described that we still don't have ratification here? Right. Um, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. I think you've, you've put it well that think of uh, removing or immunizing countries from tobacco control influence as a critically important process in order to achieve the outcomes of effective policy intervention in tobacco control. And this is an issue which is front and center in China, where the tobacco control monopoly sits at the table of uh, setting tobacco control policy. And uh, there is some hope that that might change over time. Um, but getting the industry out of the business of uh, affecting government is going to be a long range and challenging effort in many countries. Hello, my name uh, my name's John Bloom. I'm a consultant to health groups on tobacco policy issues. And I have a question about um, an executive order that was issued late in the Clinton administration on global tobacco control. And I think most of it has been well implemented and, and is kind of historical now. One of the key provisions, though, was that HHS would be consulted and fully involved in tobacco trade policy issues going forward. And in the last administration, that seemed to happen uh, when it happened at all in more of a, a very pro forma last minute way. And I'm wondering if you're satisfied with how that's implemented now? Is it fully implemented, or is that something that um, is still a work in progress? Thanks. My understanding is that uh, the situation, as I said earlier, is far better than it was, and there's a real commitment. Uh, it's not as if we have to convince other parts of the US government to do the right thing. They want to do the right thing, and they're working uh, to do that. If there are remaining specific concerns on trade policy, we should become aware of and address those. Tom? Tom Boyke, uh, Center for Global Development. Thank you, Dr. Freedom, for your, uh, your speech, and congratulations, uh, CSAS, on this great event. Um, what I wanted to ask you is you made the point that uh, what's critical for tobacco control in uh, low- and middle-income countries, or really anywhere, is political leadership and for that to extend beyond the health ministry. 
And I think that's true. I think that's probably true for a lot of health issues, whether that's HIV or other. And I think part of the way that has come about or the role the US government has played in that is by making it clear that it's a global health priority to them. And I think CDC has done a lot on international and tobacco control, but I was wondering in the lead up to the summit, what more do you see the US government being able to do to signal that global tobacco control is a priority to it, to give the political space for leaders in countries to come forward? Is it making it an explicit part of the GHI? What, what, steps, what steps can it take specifically? Well, one of the things that we're doing is engaging with WHO uh, and other partners to help identify and promote uh, effective measures and goals so that we will have ambitious, accountable targets. I think this is very, very important that we, if things go well over the next six months, in October, we'll say, aha, we now have specific, ambitious, um, accountable targets that have been agreed upon and that we can measure progress in the world against over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And that, I think, is what we need to work toward in the next few years. But I don't think it's, it's merely the U.S. that needs to do this. I think we need to ensure that from around the world, uh, the commitment to NCD control results in the laser-like focus of coming out of September with specific, measurable, accountable targets that the world will hold itself to. We're getting towards the end of the hour. May I just ask one closing question about money? And we really haven't talked much about money. And for many of the emerging economies, it's really more about political will and about policy. And but for low-income countries, you could make the case that offering incentives to build capacity and make these some of the changes, you know, which wouldn't necessarily be all that expensive, but nonetheless, creating some kind of reservoir of resources that can be applied against um, ambitions to put in place many of these core uh, measures might actually be quite beneficial. And uh, Tom Boyke's done a lot of thinking about that uh, at CGD. And, and um, I wanted to just ask you, how important is this? And might we see any in innovative uh, measures pursued in, uh, in New York? September along those lines that might shift the, get beyond that 9% of compliance by putting forward some, some incentives to lift the, some of those enforcements. I, I'm intrigued by the cash on delivery model and how it might be applied to tobacco control to try to get countries at the highest level to buy in to what needs to be done. I, one of the challenges in non-communicable disease control is that so much of what needs to happen is very far afield from the health ministry. And um, the health ministry can advocate. Mm -hmm. the health in, in various countries, the health ministry may be able to administer or document. But ultimately, it may be the finance ministry or the prime minister's office or the justice uh, ministry that has to actually take the action. And uh, it's certainly a model that's well worth exploring, uh, as are other models. I, I do think that, that resources are important um, to foster progress, um, the ability of the WHO, CDC, World Bank, IMF to provide technical support to countries mm -hmm. to try to increase taxation and use that to run programs is, is very important. I think one of the lessons we've learned in the U.S. is that although uh, from a purist standpoint you might say there's no reason or it's inefficient to earmark tobacco taxes for tobacco control, politically, it makes enormous sense. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, it increases even further the, the political acceptability and popularity of tobacco mm -hmm. taxes. And second, it provides you with a revenue stream that enables you to continue to drive down tobacco use rates. And without that, you're really challenged to continue to make progress. So. Um, Tobacco taxation is a potential way of generating resources for tobacco control. Um, I don't think the world community can rely indefinitely on the Bloomberg and Gates foundations to fund this. 
uh, bilateral donors are going to be hard pressed to fund non-communicable mm -hmm. disease control, um, both because it's a policy issue and because it doesn't have the as obvious a self-interested mm -hmm. argument. Um, so it is going to require leadership at the country level if there will be progress. Okay. Please join me in thanking Dr. Frieden. Thanks so much. I'd like to invite our next panel. Please come forward and we'll get started. So we're going to jump right into the next phase of our session here. Um, we have uh, uh, four very diverse and very distinguished personalities who work on different dimensions of tobacco control. Uh, on my right, Yolanda Richardson, uh, who's an official with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. She's an attorney. She has a very broad and diverse background working on issues pertaining to global development, to health, to gender empowerment, um, HIV AIDS, uh, and uh, lucky for the Tobacco Free Kids uh, has come over and, and, and leading their effort uh, through the, with the support of the Bloomberg Foundation in building capacities in four or five key areas in a number of 14 or 15 key states. Um, uh, next to me is Dr. Uh, Vinayak Prasad uh, from WHO, where he's the senior advisor on the Tobacco Free Initiative. He also uh, is very active in that role uh, in, 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 build, in an aggressive effort to build capacity in, in Africa. Um, he comes with an extensive background as a medical doctor and practitioner, uh, years of service in the Indian Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, as well as work in the Ministry of Finance on taxation and smuggling. Um, to my left, uh, Samira Asma from CDC. Dr. Asma uh, is the chief of the Global Tobacco Control Branch at CDC. Um, she has been integrally involved in many of these major global survey efforts that we saw referenced and placed up today. Uh, the Global Tobacco Surveillance System, the Youth Survey, uh, the recently completed Global Adult Tobacco Survey. Uh, she's very involved in the training program, the Field Epidemiological Training Program and its application on tobacco control. Welcome, Samira. Um, Dr. Adriana Blanco from PAHO, welcome. Adriana. Uh, she is a tobacco control officer there and a drug dependency expert and comes also with extensive in-country experience from her home in Uruguay and the national tobacco control efforts there. So welcome and thank you all uh, for being with us. Um, when we had talked beforehand about how to structure this conversation, we wanted to really tap your perspectives because you, you bring from your own different institutional backgrounds and professional experiences, you bring such extensive and granular uh, knowledge about what has happened in these last several years. I mean, this is a period of a remarkable expansion of effort, a remarkable enlargement of the institutions involved, and you have in force a major, the first major global health treaty that gives you a framework, uh, expectations are up. So maybe you could all share with us, and we can just start with Yolanda and move on. Sort of what, when you look back on the last five or six years, what have been the major gains? What have been the major uh, uh, forms of progress that you've seen? And you might add with that also, what have been some of the more sobering revelations in this period uh, that also came forward in a in a uh, period in which expectations rose dramatically, dollar levels rose, uh, expectations in terms of
compliance with treaties and the like. Yolanda, can you kick this off? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks so much, Steve, for, for having me. Um, I think one of the clearly exciting things about working on global tobacco control and the opportunity that that's really been presented is very much the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, mm -hmm. which really does give us a global you know, blueprint for how to move tobacco control forward. So that's a really exciting you know, um, aspect to have as a way of beginning to push policy reform at the country level. There are now 172 countries that have ratified the Framework Convention. At the national level, what we find having that blueprint in place really does provide us with the opportunity to really engage countries because they have already made the political commitment to address tobacco control. So I think that under, underlies um, real efforts to move tobacco control at the country level. Well, we've seen some really um, interesting progress, I think, in the last five years. have been in surprising places and have also been in places where uh, we think we would have expected it. Um, so for example, I think certainly in the last couple of years, as, as, as Tom referenced in his introductory remarks, we've been quite surprised to see some real challenges, ha changes happening in places we wouldn't have expected. So Russia, for example, I think is the one that has all had us fairly animated with Putin's recent decision to um, back a national concept mm -hmm. to move tobacco control forward. Um, you know, what the underlying sort of uh, reasons for that movement are not all that clear. Some of us feel like it's because of sort of demographic shifts in Russia, but it's very clear that a lot of groundwork has been laid to make that happen. In places like China, you're seeing increasing sentiments to uh, support tobacco control in a very tough environment where China is both the world's largest consumer as well as the world's largest producer of tobacco. But I think one of the things we felt, and certainly the role that the campaign has played, is really trying to change both in the country public perceptions of tobacco control, both to generate public pressure to make countries feel comfortable mm -hmm. who've already made the political commitment to implement tobacco control, really move forward to do that. And so we engage in a whole range of activities to really bring that public pressure to bear and to really work with non-governmental organizations who want to be effective advocates for tobacco control. So we're seeing real changes, real shifts in the political climates in a lot of these countries and feel fairly optimistic that that has increased the momentum for, for the policy reform that governments have already committed themselves to. Thank you. Diane? Uh, the uh, WHO FCTC provided the first opportunity for the governments to come to one platform and negotiate for a uh, common agreed strategy. And that was something which uh, actually unleashed a lot of interest within governments, within the, each country. So if, you, if we look at uh, that as an opportunity, uh, it, it, is, it, it helped articulate, for example, with my own, um, own limited experience of having worked as a focal point in the Ministry of Health, I could go back to the minister and say, Minister, we, we ratified this. We can do this. It's within our mandate. We can make a law. And he could go to the cabinet and get it done. So some things which, were, uh, which are within the purview of the Ministries of Health were easily done, are still manageable to be done. But there are things within the FCTC, which like, for example, raising taxes, it's not within the domain of the Minister of Health, it's still not there. So what has happened is, over the years, the acceptability level of, on tobacco control has gone up in the Ministries of Health. It's still not reached uh, a stage where we have acceptance of all stakeholders. So. Uh, that's the, that's the progress which we have made in the last few years, uh, I would say in most of the countries. And the summit, uh, the way I see it, allows us to create that multi-sectoral, higher level engagement, both within the governments and between the governments, on, on moving to the next big step for tobacco control. Thank you. Samira, what have you discovered and seen in your work? Oh, during the time when FCTC was being negotiated in 1999, um, there was a loud cry for data from ma majority of the developing countries. There was a l clear lack of data mm -hmm. on which they could base their arguments. That led to the in, uh, development of the Global Youth Tobacco Survey, which was initiated in nine countries in 1999. And what, what we have seen today is now over 10 years, we have a coverage of uh, GYTS and the data emerging from about 180 countries. 
And this is a system where countries have repeated the survey several times, at least up to four times in majority of the countries. And they have used during the negotiations the data that was emerging as a result of these surveys facilitated by WHO and CDC that led to many countries even ratifying it, even though it was youth-specific data, but this was the only data that countries could base their arguments. It was not only focusing on the prevalence of tobacco use, but also key tobacco control indicators uh, on which the FCTC framework was designed. And uh, during the course of that phase where the FCTC began its negotiations to its ratification, uh, and today, we recognize that there was still a need for adult data. And that led to the Global Adult Tobacco mm -hmm. Survey as a result of the investments from the Bloomberg Initiative. Uh, and now we have 14 country data that was presented. So I see that uh, we have a very solid database and evidence base uh, that we could uh, evaluate uh, what works and I think the Empower strategies and the articles uh, outlined in the Framework Convention uh, can really uh, be driven by the data from the countries. Thank you. Adriana. Well, I agree with all my colleagues here <laughs> that the milestone is obviously the WHO FCTC. I think this is not only a milestone for tobacco control, and most important, I think this is a shift in the way that public health may be done from now on. And I think that the summit will be a win-win situation because I think it's not only will help to enhance tobacco control, but I think that they're going to take some experience from the tobacco field because we have some experience to show. Mm -hmm. We have seen how controlling, for example, smoke-free environment has led very, in a short period of time, to the decrease of the increase or the decrease of the incidence of infarction of myocardial, and this is very a very important thing because usually. Government think that tobacco control will have some gains you know, of winning things in the very long future. And mm -hmm. we are showing them that in short period, like one year, they can see something, something very important going on on the people. So I think this is important. And at the same time, I, I, as Tom and Frieden said, that it's very important to have concrete uh, goals because uh, I think perhaps one of the weakness of the FCTC is that it doesn't have teeth. It has, in that, has a way in order to, to really make the countries accountable. Even though we are trying to find some other ways, for example, one interesting way is to link uh, this treaty with other treaties, like for example, the one in human rights. Mm -hmm. So it's very important when you are talking about the smoke-free environment, for example, that there is a lot of human right, uh, rights in, involved in that, and you can take this issue on the, side, on the field of the human rights and there they have a, an international court and they have mm -hmm. uh, again teeth for, for taking this and mm -hmm. for example in Guatemala was one of the things that was used by a co domestic court in order to keep a uh, smoke free environment legislation that had been sued by the tobacco industry. Yeah. This is very interesting because I mean what I hear you saying is that of the new factors that are at play we have a civil, so civil society organizations that are appearing that did not exist at the same level of energy and expertise. We have ministries of health that are empowered by the treaty to make their case. We have the power of new data. We have demonstration cases, the Uruguays and others that are proving short-term gains are within reach and, and, and having imp impact. And the power of concrete goals. Now there's a lot of outstanding business to be done and we do have this meeting in September which we'll come back to in a moment because I do want to ask you what you see as the, the most achievable, robust, feasible goals on the, within tobacco control that should be targeted there. But before we get to that, let's turn things around and, a, and I'd like to ask each of you, you know, what do you fear the most looking ahead in the next 10 years, five to 10 years? What do you, what do you fear the most in terms of realizing the, the, the goals that you have seen and which you have all embraced in your own professional um, existence. We don't need to keep in a numerical progression here. Please just jump in. What do you fear the most? I think the deaths that are happening as we speak, uh, because one of the latest, I was thinking one in every, every eight seconds, a person dies due to tobacco use. Um, and I think that is, uh, that is ticking. 
uh, as the time takes, we are losing a lot of people. So I think the sense of urgency and uh, coupled with the commitment and resources, we know what works, and it is about uh, accelerating uh, the actions. Uh. But what do you see as the major, as, as your major obstacle, <coughs> the major hindrance in being able to achieve the things that you're, 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 you're hoping for? We know of the industry as is an obstacle, and we recognize that. But despite we have seen examples like the Uruguayan example mm -hmm. or the Russia example, and I think it is the political commitment that needs to be uh, invigorated. And if we see more of Uruguay's and more of Russia's leading the way, and if there are a group of countries that could become uh, uh, that spotlight leading that change towards uh, summit and beyond. This happened with the FCTC negotiations uh, several years ago, where the African bloc did lead the negotiations, even though they were resource scarce. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we saw a result. So hopefully that now we can see some major uh, developed countries coming forth as a bloc mm -hmm. and saying we, ha we can make this uh, mm -hmm. into a reality. Well, I think one of the things that sort of worries me are sort of the untapped markets that are probably going to get tapped more quickly than we are able to get up to speed. Mm -hmm. um, among them is what was highlighted in by Tom is, you know, the gender issue. I mean, right now you've got 3% smoking rates among women in China, but if all of a sudden those went to 5, 10, 20%, you're talking about a real mm -hmm. explosion mm -hmm. of both the number and of people <coughs> who are dying from tobacco control. So that worries me a lot, particularly as we look at the data that shows that increasing numbers of girls are starting to smoke. So that demographic is, is, is one of real concern, and I know all of us are, are, are paying So your fear to is, should there be a priority in terms of commercial strat marketing strategy that was effective and locked on to some of those demographics, those untapped markets, you could see some major, some, some real, major regression. Some real major uptick in sort of yeah. prevalence rates. And then the other you know, big untapped market is, is, is Africa. Um, the prevalence rates, again, are very low still there. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so it could very well. Um, as Africa begins to go through a demographic transition, like all countries hopefully will eventually do, you'll see you have the potential of having some real, some real problems there as well. And you know, all of this is challenged by countries who are constantly struggling to set priorities among many different priorities, development priorities, and many different health priorities. And because we know the tobacco tends to not show up as immediately or as visibly as other mm -hmm. health priorities, it doesn't always get the resources or the political capital that's needed to really address yeah. those potential threats. Mayo, do you have any fears? Um, basically two. One is that if you do not have a uh, shared understanding, it would be very difficult. Let's, let's say, let's take Bhutan. They banned tobacco, but they didn't make any progress because everything came in from India. So it's not possible for tobacco control to progress if all of us do not agree on certain minimum standards. The industry is quick enough to move whether, uh, let, let's take another example. Uganda raised taxes, industry moved to Tanzania. In, in the, the, the industry wanted to move, make investment in Swaziland and uh, civil society got, it, got the government to oppose it. They move to, they're now more wanting to move to Lesotho. So the industry moves faster, and so we need to have a common shared understanding, number one. The industry is very innovative. Industry started looking at dissolvable tobacco products. The industry looking at e-cigarettes. Industry is looking at, as Yolanda said, looking at women. I mean, it, look at consumption pattern in Southeast Asia, and so women do not consume tobacco so much. But if there, there's a huge gap which they, would, they, they want to tap. Look at Nigeria, for example. Youth consumption is now reaching almost the same level as Russia, whereas adult prevalence is, even, is less than half. The industry is already there. So do we have uh, uh, two, two con I, at least I have two serious concerns. One is the industry moves faster than us, and two, we, uh, we do not have a shared understanding, we will be in trouble. Mm. Well, I can say I have concern, not fear, because we have advanced so much in the last year. So I think that we keep on advancing. But my concern, of the first one, of course, is the power of the tobacco industry, because in this region specifically, we have the experience that they are r making a big, big effort in, in every one of the countries trying to undermine all our policies. And we have 10 fronts at the same time that we need mm -hmm. to face. 
The second thing uh, I think is the that I think is the the basis of the problem that is the the thing the the relationship or the the way that you the the world will see profits versus public health. And I think this is something that needs to be discussed because today is the tobacco industry, but tomorrow with non-communicable diseases will be fault uh, companies, uh, many others. So we need to begin to think that there should be a limit for profits when there is an involvement of the public health. So, and, and I think this will be very difficult because uh, I think there are enormous forces, forces beyond that. And the third concern that I have is that we, people from public health, we cannot evolve in the way we need. We still, even though we say that these things are out of our reach, but still we are using the same uh, ways uh, of addressing the, addressing the problem, like the biological approach and this, and we need to evolve. I think we, we, did, we did it in a way, but we didn't it enough. We still need to begin to learn another language to speak to other publics in order to mm -hmm. put them in our side. Mm -hmm. Have we entered a phase where the legal challenges um, from industry are becoming sort of the front edge of the battlefield right now, do you think? Yes, uh, we are seeing that uh, the industry is going farther and farther. Be at the beginning, they, they uh, threaten the countries with a zoo when, with a zoo when they are trying to uh, pass a legislation. Mm -hmm. Now they are definitely going to, to make this, these cases when the legislation, legislation is already passed. And now Uruguay is an example of that they go to international court and specifically courts that are from the trade and from the commercial uh, side in order to push the country to, to get forward or get back of their measures. Uh, Uruguay is now being sued by the Philip Morris mm -hmm. uh, because of an uh, investment treaty that Switzerland has with Uruguay. And they are suing with three main things that are the size of the health warning, that as Thomas Friedrich say, is the biggest one in the world. Mm -hmm. The content of the health warning, because they say they denigrate the product. <laughs> and <laughs> the, another uh, legislation that we have in Uruguay that is that there is allowed only one presentation per brand. And this was done because even Uruguay banned the lights, ultralight, and this kind of uh, misleading descriptor still the tobacco industry play with colors and with other logos that they have in their marks in order to mislead the people that some uh, brands still are less dangerous than others. So in Uruguay, you cannot have, for example, Malboro red, blue, or gold. You may have only one Malboro. So they are, this is one of the, the key points of the, of the suit. And we are in the World Bank. It's not a, it's not a curve that used to be, to be very good for countries. Usually, they are supporting the private sector more than the country. So it, won't, it will be a very difficult mm -hmm. situation for Uruguay. Um, let's turn to the high-level meeting, the NCD high-level meeting in September. And um, maybe you can share with us, each of you, what you s would think of as the, as the one or two most feasible and valuable kind of achievements or outcomes that could come from that. We've heard about policy changes, prevalence changes, targets. That seems to be very much in the, uh, in the era of discussion. And then how do you get to those? You know, how, how do you realize whatever it is you think is the, is the top priority? What do you see as the political strategy for bringing those forward and then carrying them forward to see compliance? Because when you look at the data on the treaty, it was a sort of mixed, you know, with a Tom Frieden's presentation, it's a sort of mixed set of messages. One is, it was, the treaty was historic. It, it can created a political consensus. It gave benchmarks. It put people on the hook. It also has, you know, when you start doing the measurement, shows you some dispiriting, some dispiriting outcomes, a lack of compliance and teeth enforcement, incentives, wills, all of that. So with that in mind, as you look forward into, uh, into uh, September, um, what is it? What is it that we should be thinking about that will not just put us again into a position where, uh, where m targets are set which aren't necessarily enforceable? How do we get to a position where we're stronger rather than, rather than weaker or even? 
Rhonda, what's your feeling? Well, I think, you know, by far to me, one of the most exciting things that, uh, about the opportunity um, represented in the high level meetings is to take tobacco <coughs> control outside of the sole purview of the Ministry of Health. I mean, the one benefit is that it has been a public health treaty, and that's mm -hmm. been fantastic and brilliant and has gotten us as far as we've gotten. Mm -hmm. But the opportunity to really bring the full weight of the entire UN system around tobacco control is quite attractive. You would have the opportunity to really ask, and I think one of our asks ought to be that we make sure that tobacco control is integrated into all of the mechanisms throughout the UN systems and the multilateral, and the multilateral the bank, <laughs> banking system, so that all of the, the full weight of the UN system is really directed toward looking at tobacco control. So whether it's you know, the UN Commission on Women, it's looking at the gender dimensions of, of tobacco control, mm -hmm. or whether it's UNFPA, it's looking at what are the demographic implications of tobacco control, or the multilateral banks are having being called upon to say, mm -hmm. how does tobacco impact our lending programs or our, or our granting programs? To put that full weight behind of the UN system behind tobacco control would really be, is for me, mm -hmm. one of the most promising aspects of what we could get out of the high level meeting. Um, it also, as I think Tom rightly s uh, said, with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, we have an overarching blueprint for tobacco control. And so to have the UN system further endorse that by s calling on, on member countries to really put, make the commitment to fully implement the FCTC. Now while the FCTC doesn't, um, in its architecture, have a lot of the specifics, the guidelines do. They don't have the force of law, but they have the specificity, I think, that helps us begin to get some depth mm -hmm. around the FCTC. So having countries really help hold themselves accountable to the commitment they've made under the FCT and the specificity that's offered by the guidelines really does provide mm -hmm. two powerful ways for us to move tobacco control. So there's formal outcomes in terms of targets and specificity and perhaps mechanisms that give greater pressure and incentives for compliance. There's the intangible or the more political outcomes that you're talking about, which is bringing the right people to the table to stand by this, elevating it to another level than where it was before. Samir, what do you think? Uh, the fact that there should be a healthy competition and an accountability tied to whatever is being signed off by the governments and the heads of states that would meet in September, I think articulating that and getting the commitment there would be important. But how do we articulate what those accountability criteria or elements might be uh, could be uh, drawn upon from some of the uh, easy to achieve targets like the smoke free in pu uh, public places. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a easy target could be set where all the countries could potentially sign off and there could be an interim a way to review the progress and independent body could potentially review the commitment that would ultimately be signed in September. Mm -hmm. So matching the targets with the accountability and a review uh, with an independent body, which is not just in terms of paper and pencil, but in real action. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, I think that it will be a, a good opportunity because at the, moment, at the moment that the FCTC was negotiated, even it may be unbelievable, in the countries, many of the parliamentaries, many of the people in the ministry, they don't know, they didn't know anything about the FCTC. So perhaps now that it's going to be an involvement of the whole government and not only of the Ministry of Health, maybe we have a better understanding of the FCTC and now it's a, another opportunity to put it forward in, in, in the countries. But I see that definitely we need to have at least some core set, core of, of goals, like for example, prevalence should be one of them. And I think mm -hmm. that smoke-free environment is one of the of the key issues. Not because, as, as Dr. Friedman said, uh, taxes are the most uh, effective individually, but I think that the power of a smoke-free environment is how they denormalize the use of, of tobacco. And really, it's very difficult to counteract by the tobacco industry, because now the only thing that they can do, they can say, is, as always, the eventual losses in the, in the hospitality sector, that we have more and more data that shows that they, it's mm -hmm. not going to happen. So, I think these two are key elements that we need. So that some mean. concrete targets on prevalence mm -hmm. in X period of time, see those reductions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then commitments towards smoke totally free smoke free. Totally yeah. smoke free. Yeah. Yeah, in addition to concrete prevalence targets, the policy outcomes are equally important. Out of the 172 parties, 
think around 140 have a missed obligation of putting pictorial warnings on all products. Mm -hmm. They have missed obligation of complete ban on advertisements, sponsorship, and promotions. Doesn't cost money. So where is it that the political will is lacking? If they have committed to doing this, they have missed their deadlines, 140 can e easily make it happen. So that's something which is uh, going to come from political support and uh, getting the multiple stakeholders to be engaged. But more important is, where is the money going to come from? Who's going to fund this? Governments themselves need to raise their allocation from their own health allocation from, from, their, from the Ministry of Finance, also from international uh, funding for the low, lower uh, income countries. And who gets to implement this? Is there a body who's going to implement? Or is it just, as, do, as Dr. Frieden said, we have this beautifully drafted resolution, but nobody to help implement? Where is the implementation, uh, implementation body? Because the secretariat or the, uh, the, uh, or the convention instruments do not provide for a compliance mechanism. Where is the compliance mechanism? How does it go to, go to come in? So those are kind of uh, key asks for me in the summit. But isn't it true that, I mean, there, in this period of austerity and crowded, a very crowded set of institutions, people seem to be moving in a very pragmatic towards looking at, you know, okay, let's narrow our targets to a couple, two or three, and as you were saying about advertisements um, and um, some of the other policy implementation commitments, simply getting a renewal to go back and live up to those obligations in a, in a different context with a little bit more of a spotlight, that's powerful, potentially powerful. Um, but I'm not sure that you're going, I, I'm skeptical I mean, we, I asked this question around, well, where, where might money be innovatively raised? Um, there's a lot of deliberation around solidarity taxes and the like. But I, I just think there's, there's, in this current context, there's, that's the money side and the broad global initiative, in, new institutional initiative, is likely not to be a prominent piece. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just seems to me that you're going to have a more, a more focused effort around setting some, some targets for policy uh, and for prevalence uh, and uh, trying to leverage the political commitments in a very visible and conspicuous way mm -hmm. from leaders who have not really been very present or visible and conspicuous up to now, but where you might, the door might be open to do that. Um, I'd like to invite our, our, our audience members to come forward and offer some questions and comments, please. Hi, I'm Prabhu Pongcha. I'm a consultant to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and some other groups. I come from a tobacco background when a three cent increase in tobacco taxes was considered a major victory. Um, you talked about uh, suing the industry uh, or the industry suing governments. Have there been examples of uh, public health organizations suing governments for not implementing FCTC? Is there anything in the FCTC that would give a local NGO an opportunity to bring a lawsuit against a, just a, a party that signed the treaty? There, there are a couple of examples that are interesting, all that took sort of different um, sort of takes. In, uh, in Bangladesh, there was actually a court decision that ruled that tobacco cultivation was contradictory with food security. And there was a, a government court ruling that basically reaffirmed that tobacco cultivation, limiting tobacco cultivation in order to address a food security concern. So that was the, the hook and the angle in, in Bangladesh. In, um, in Mexico, there was an attempt to try to look at the right to health as a way to sort of ask the government to fulfill its commitments um, uh, to health um, and there was just a recent decision around uh, the Mexico decision where basically it, Mexico it has an interesting procedural um, uh, limitation in the fact that it, it doesn't have public interest in litigation. So we cleared one hurdle in, in, in the fact that we were allowed to present the argument, the case, but because there wasn't a remedy, um, the, court did, they, they didn't, the court did not discuss the merits. But that was an effort to be proactive in terms of trying to move the tobacco agenda. And then most recently in India, um, there's been an effort using an environmental argument to limit um, the packaging of gutka, which is smokeless tobacco, uh, in India, to limit 
the, um, the ability for it to be sold in plastic containers using an environmental argument. So I think that there are a number of ways in which I think creative advocates are beginning to think about how to, to use the law not only defensively, but offensively to try to get the tobacco industry on its back heels. It's tough, but there are some real creative things that are being done. Any other comments? I think that there is, uh, in our region, it's difficult. The FCTC has an article that calls for uh, holding the tobacco industry accountable for the damage they made. But I think that in Latin America, and specifically, we don't have this uh, culture of, of making suits against a, a big corporative corporation. In, in Brazil, there have been a couple of attempts from patients going against the, the tobacco industry. But as far as I know, not of, can of people going against the country for not implementing the FCTC. Mm -hmm. Uh, my own experience, I had to defend a case in India where a civil society group uh, took us to court for not having labs and not regulating the products. And uh, we, uh, we committed to, uh, to the courts that within a period of two years, uh, we would set up labs and do it. So we missed that deadline, but the, the government is now almost there with the labs in India. Sir, did you have any comments? Sir. <coughs> I'm Hsinzu Lu from uh, Fogarty International Center at NIH. Together with NCI and NIDA, we have supported the uh, international uh, tobacco research and the training program uh, over the last, last decades. So my question for you is that what do you see the role of research, tobacco, international tobacco research, as well as research capacity building activity? I think this is a very, very uh, interesting question because uh, uh, there are two parts to this. One is how do we excite the uh, ac academia, the, the top universities in the world to research on tobacco control? How do you reduce the cost of care? I mean, while it is true that uh, it wouldn't have that full scale uh, impact in the beginning, but there is, there is still one third of the uh, world's population which is consuming tobacco. So we need to make it accessible for them to be treated. I mean, can't we have uh, an NRT which costs, uh, costs, uh, costs something like aspirin? So that's, that's something which is missing. We do not have that research. We do not have that focus. And uh, the other area of research is to document uh, some of the work which is done because people do not know what's happening in different parts of the world. So there are efforts, for example, NIH is working now on a global report on smokeless tobacco. So it's important to document some of that finding and help countries uh, implement tobacco control. Yes, in, in this region, I can tell you that we have both need the research and the capacity building for research because the countries are constantly asking us for help them to have new data that they need to, because uh, you know, many of the data that we have is from developed countries. So countries need to have their own data in order to push their own uh, authorities to move. So really, as PAHO, we will be very, very interested in seeing how we can enhance this in the region because it's a very important need that we, we have. I would just echo that as well because what we find, uh, we're very committed to evidence-based advocacy. So mm -hmm. we are constantly being asked when we're engaged in advocacy activities help us show to make the case, whether it's the case that it's not going to have an economic impact, mm -hmm. it's not a, going to decrease productivity, et cetera. Um, so we're really committed to this and think this is a very important and, and critical issue. I would say, though, that um, you know, we haven't, because it just isn't you know, sort of our um, mandate, haven't looked at sort of research capacity in that countries. But invariably, we always hear from countries that they want country-based research, mm -hmm. um, that it isn't enough just to show the international examples. They want to know in their country this would be applied. I mean, people believe in exceptionalism, so. <laughs> yes, and I can tell you that the, the use of national data is so much powerful. We have that in uh, experience in Uruguay, for example, when we use the nicotine research in order to show this was the first time that people really believe that there was contamination from tobacco smoke in the place because they saw their bars, their hospital, the, pla the places that they know, really. Yeah. So it's very powerful for, for the region, for our region. I would like to make a comment about what type of research. Um, I think that distinction needs to be made. I think we need to promote r research that is relevant for policy and interventions rather than very basic molecular level research. Mm -hmm. Uh, data already is available. It is about how we build the capacity in the country so that the data can be used 
to link to the policy interventions and help that uh, if policies to be progressive and evaluated uh, so that the governments can take a constant action because the data is being generated at a regular intervals of time do, uh, via this <coughs> global tobacco surveillance system. So a caution, while we need research, but what kind of research, mm -hmm. I think that distinction needs to be made given in the, this mm -hmm. rich source constraint environment. Other comments or questions? that with the Framework Convention Alliance. And I think in, in to, to ensure that we can have adequate implementation of the FCTC, I think we've seen a lot of progress in the past few years, but to, to a large extent, a, a lack of resources. And I think this summit is one step towards integrating the FCTC, implementation of the FCTC and the tobacco control in the development agenda and ensure that, and also increase multi-sectoral approach, uh, tobacco, Policies, a lot, of little, a lot of the most effective ones are not very expensive. I mean, from smoke free policies, uh, ad bans, and others, that can be done without a tremendous amount of um, funding as if you compare it to some other interventions for other issues and other diseases. But we have the summit coming up. There's a large, you know, we're addressing four diseases and four risk factors, huge list of demands. And I think tobacco control and FCTC implementation, and especially for tobacco control, we have a tool, a global tool, uh, which has been now ratified by more, you know, 171 countries and the uh, European Union. So to have an increased commitment uh, to, to, towards the treaty, elevate the awareness, but then also ensure that it's one step. It's not going to be the end of it all, this summit, but it's one step towards integration in the um, development agenda, because right now it's absent from it. Thank you. Why don't I then ask our panelists to offer some closing thoughts um, in terms of uh, just wrapping up on looking forward to September and beyond and any additional thoughts that we haven't had a chance to comment on. Yolanda? I'm completely disadvantaged. I'm <laughs> 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 um, I mean, I guess the message is, is, is that, you know, the FCTC was just came into effect five years ago. So that's a fairly short mm -hmm. time horizon. So I think reminding ourselves of kind of what a remarkable progress has been made just mm -hmm. since the ratification of the, of the Framework Commission, um, Convention is really important. I think I feel gratified um, because luckily I get to travel and see work on the ground and just see sparks of hope in almost every single country, very much as, as Tom said about either advocates who are getting themselves organized to really be much more effective, um, spokespersons for tobacco control, or seeing governments taking baby steps to really try to honor their commitments, or, or a group standing up to the tobacco industry in all kinds of interesting mm -hmm. and different ways. So I guess I still remain fairly hopeful that we are on an upswing of mm -hmm. trying to advance um, our approach to tobacco control and, and that there are reasons for optimism and hope. Thank you. I would see uh, this as a huge opportunity to share best practices and successes. This is an opportunity for, for example, tobacco control advocates to advance similar treaties and similar uh, strong measures for salt reduction, for alcohol, for other NCD measures, it's not just uh, only tobacco, and make a more holistic lifestyle, promotive, preventive approach and bring, raise the horizon, raise, bring it out uh, in the domain so that it's very much in the space of political mindset to have strong uh, NCD programs in their own countries. Thank you. I would say that um, it's still important to uh, be aware that tobacco is the leading preventable cause of death and is one of the drivers to the NCDs. Uh, so not losing and diluting uh, tobacco uh, control and prevention at the country level within this whole bigger dialogue while we recognize that many of the risk factors are equally important, but not to lose that sight, uh, I think would be very critical leading to September. Thank you. Adrian. And I think that, as I said before, that this opportunity for, let's say, relaunch the, the FCTC, mm -hmm. but making more, uh, uh, more emphasis now at that it's not enough had been ratified the, the, had ratified the convention that we need to implement. The convention without national laws means nothing in the country, so mm -hmm. we need to improve that. And I think that we need to, to move the, the issue in order to see that these things need to be 
in an equal level than the Millennium Development Goals because they are part of the, the main, as, as uh, Hubert said, that the main things influence in development, developing in development, sorry, my English today is horrible, <laughs> in, the, in the world. So I think this is a good opportunity that we cannot lose yes. for that. Well, thank you all. I mean, it's, it's really quite an honor to have you here, and we're very grateful for all the great work that you do in your daily lives. And I also am very impressed by the sort of optimism and hope that's coming out of this panel. Um, from you, and uh, thank you for doing bringing that forward too. So please join me in thanking our panelists.